بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, Today we'll discuss approach to respiratory system examination Happy Eid and uh, Eid Mubarak كل عام وانتم بخير Special acknowledgement to Dr. Ahmed Meher Ali. I'd like to start by uh, saying for you some messages. Firstly, the success is a gift from Allah. Just do your best and never give up and train yourself for subconscious processing of the exam steps and how to pick up the positive physical signs so that in the exam, uh, make your brain get the finding and to do analysis of them for reaching to diagnosis and differential diagnosis. Uh, this series of uh, online clinical lecture is not a replacement for the hands-on clinical practice on real patients with your uh, supervisor. Uh, we try to make it easy, simple, and uh, approach-minded for the theoretical part the clinical exam. Regarding the most common cases in clinical exam, especially in respiratory station, number one, interstitial lung disease, bronchiectasis, COBD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, lobectomy and pneumonectomy, pleural effusion. These diseases can become individualized or mixed with each others if possible, plus or minus the complications in the form of plus or minus uh, there is pulmonary hypertension or plus or minus there is a core pulmonale in the form of right side of the heart failure, elevated GVB, tender hepatomegaly, lower limb edema, plus or minus a respiratory failure in a form of uh, flabbing tremors, asterixes, but uh, theoretically this will not, you will not face a respiratory failure in the exam but you have to mention these three negative findings if they are not available in the case to mention that there is no clinical signs suggestive of pulmonary hypertension, no clinical signs suggestive of core pulmonale, and no clinical signs suggestive of respiratory failure. In representation in respiratory cases, uh, you have to mention the following in your presentation that the patient has uh, signs like uh, color, is, is there is a pallor, jaundice, cyanosis, if there is any clubbing, if there is any nicotine staining, nicotine tar staining in his hands, any scar in the chest or any other side, uh, any uh, manifestations or stigmata of connective tissue disease, especially the rheumatoid arthritis and systemic sclerosis. Uh, also, comment about the pulse, what about the pulse rate and rhythm and volume, and if there is any special character like to mention that the patient pulse is 70 per minute, regular, equal in both sides, average volume with no special character. Then the respiratory rate, how many per minute? The respiratory rate is about uh, 12, 16 per minute like this. GVB, is it elevated or not elevated? And comment about the waveform the wave like A wave and V wave, as we mentioned before in the cardioresistation and also we mentioned here in the respiratory station. Uh, comment about trachea, is it central or deviated to right side or deviated to the left side? Uh, normally the trachea is central and it might be slightly deviated normally to the right side. Then comment about the uh, chest ex expansion and percussion note and uh, auscultation. Uh, like chest expansion, is it uh, normal or there is limited uh, in expansion in a specific site? And regarding the percussion note, if it is resonant or dullness, like in bird uh, percussion note. And comment about auscultation by four important things. The air entry, is it uh, equal air entry or no? The type of breathing, is it vesicular or bronchial? And the additional sounds like ronchi, which is the wheezes, and crepitations, which is the uh, rails. Then comment about the 
three important uh, negative signs if it is not available. You have to mention it that there is no pulmonary hypertension or no core pulmonary or no uh, manifestations of respiratory fatigue. So this is the uh, typical presentation. And finally, you can mention my conclusion that this patient has a clinical picture suggestive of uh, like uh, bronchiectasis, like uh, pulmonary fibrosis, like chlorectomy, like COBD, like this, for further uh, examination or for further investigations, like we will mention later on. So this is the most important topics when you are presenting your respiratory case uh, in front of the examiners. In respiratory examination, firstly, we'll start by introduction and greeting to the patient. Introduce yourself. I am Dr. Murabi, one of the uh, doctors here. I will examine your chest and your body. Is it okay with you? With shaking hands and with smiling. Then a general uh, survey, checking the patient as generally from the uh, bed side. Then check the hands. We mentioned all that in details, but I am just enumerating the important topics, then checking the pulse, checking the respiratory rate, checking the GVB and the carotid pulsations, check, checking the trochea, and checking the face regarding the eyes and mouth, then examine the chest itself by inspection, palpation, percussion, auscultation, inspection for any scars, deformities, palpation about the apex is very important, because in case of Cartagena syndrome, which will be associated with bronchitis, you will find that the apex will be in the right side, not the left side. Uh, then also checking the chest expansion in palpation. Then percussion note is it resonant or dullness. Then the auscultation regarding the air entry and type of breathing and additional sounds like bronchi or crepitations. Then examination of the lower limb in edema like cough muscles, plus or minus lymph node examination if it is necessary or you suspect a case like tuberculosis or sarcoidosis or malignancy. Then the end of the examination. So these are the important topics in respiratory examination. I'd like to remind you that the chest examination, inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation, these four items, we do it from the front and from the back. So the chest examination uh, is considered a long, uh, long time because you examine the front and the back by the same uh, parameters, inspection, palpation, percussion, auscultation from the front and from uh, the back as well. Before starting examination, you have to do hand sterilization while reading the instruction. There is a paper in for, uh, above the patient. Read the instruction carefully. Then greeting to the patient. Say, hello, madam. Hello, sir. I am Dr. Murabi, uh, one of the doctors here to examine you. Shake hands and tell the patient, nice to meet you with a smile. And then introduce yourself and take a... a verbal consent from the patient that uh, he agree or she agrees uh, to be examined by you. Then ask the patient, do you have any pain? Uh, if you have any pain or discomfort, please let me know. Then the patient position should, should be sitting up at a 45% degree. Then do a good exposure of the chest with after permission of the patient to expose the chest carefully. And don't hesitate to expose the patient, and usually in the exam, the patient will be ready to be examined. Then, coming to the, the general survey, inspection. In inspection, uh, put your hands behind your back and take a few steps backward, checking the patient and the bed in from his leg side, and tell the patient that I, I am, uh, I, I, I'd like to have a look uh, from your uh, food site, okay? Uh, by the general inspection, you are checking some uh, survey about the patient, and this can give you a clue uh, regarding uh, the diagnosis or the differential diagnosis. Like uh, age, if the patient is young, so you are thinking about asthma, 
uh, cystic fibrosis, bronchitis, if the patient is old, you can check about COBD, long-standing smoking, interstitial lung disease, or cancer. Checking the patient, if the patient is comfortable or distressed, any signs of distress, the patient using his accessory muscles, working LMSI, abdominal breathing, if the patient is tachypneic, high respiratory rate, uh, usually it's uh, uncommon to have a distressed or uncomfortable patient at the exam. But you have to put this in your mind, in your uh, general uh, practical life. Then you check if the patient is, has cyanosis or no. Then you check the, check the uh, surrounding of the patient regarding the uh, oxygen, if the patient on uh, a cannula, so is hospitalized, taking uh, tropinous antibiotic. It's besides the patient, any inhalation, any uh, nebulizer, any inhaler. Uh, sputum pot is very important. If the patient has uh, a current productive uh, cough, in the case of bronchiectasis, any steroid bracelet or uh, knee glasses, especially if the patient is depending on steroid for a long time, especially in the cases of pulmonary fibrosis. Then checking the skin, if there is any scars in the chest, like thoracotum scars, we will go to this scar by details in the next slides. If there is any nicotine batch, especially in the patient uh, trying to quit smoking, uh, any radiation burns in case of malignancy. Checking the chest wall regarding any deformity in a specific shape, like barrel shaped chest in case of COBD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Checking the nutritional status, body built of the patient. Is the patient under body built, cachexia, uh, matching with cancer, cystic fibrosis, or COBD? Uh, we ask the patient to take a deep breath in and breath out, then ask him to cough. By this action, you are checking the chest movement, any uh, retraction in one side or any uh, limited chest expansion on one side comparing to the other side and also uh, you are checking the, the type of cuff uh, and the sound of cuff by uh, uh, by your ear by your ear uh, if the patient has dry cuff you are thinking about asthma or interstitial lung fibrosis if the patient has productive cuff sputum you are thinking about cystic fibrosis bronchitis or COBD if you hear a ronchi, uh, especially if it is an inspiratory ronchi, it's matching with strider, or expiratory ronchi, it's matching with obstructive lung disease. Usually, the inspiratory ronchi is uh, indicated strider, which is a critical condition. Usually, you will not face an uh, example like this in your exam, but uh, you need to put this in your mind to know that inspiratory strider indicating Inspiratory ronchi indicating that there is a stridor. Uh, checking the asymmetry of chest expansion, as I mentioned before. Then, lastly, the uh, lower limb, if you have a lower limb edema, so definitely you are suspecting that this patient has a core pulmonary, which means that the patient has right sided uh, heart failure, uh, secondary to a uh, chest disease or chest complication. Uh, then go to examine the hands of the patient, checking if the patient has a cyanosis or no, checking if the patient has clubbing or no, uh, checking if the hand of the patient is warm. If, the, if it's warm, it indicates there is vasodilatation due to chronic CO2 retention. Checking if the patient has uh, features of rheumatological diseases in his hand, like uh, rheumatoid arthritis features, like uh, the deformity, potomere, swan neck, uh, uh, or manifestation of systemic sclerosis, tight skin. So you will suspect that this patient has a lung fibrosis or a rheumatoid lung disease as a complication of these rheumatological diseases. Checking the hand for nicotine tar staining, uh, especially in the dominant hand. Also checking if there is a wasting of small muscle of the hand. Uh, this wasting of the muscle indicates that there is involvement of uh, T1 by a tumor like Pankos tumor. Then you're checking the, about the tremors. In the tremors, you 
have a fine tremors or flabbing tremors. Fine tremors indicate that this patient is on long-term uh, beta-2 agonist and side effect of the drug. Flabbing tremors, which called astrexis, it, it come in uh, type 2 respiratory failure due to retention of COED, retention of C, uh, carbon, mon uh, carbon monoxide uh, in case of uh, COVD. So this respiratory failure type 2 due to increased CO2 in case of COVD re result in asterixis flabbing tremors. To differentiate between fine tremors and flabbing tremors, it can be uh, by the position of the hand. Like uh, if you ask the patient to stretch his hand in front of him like this, and you find tremors, this is a fine tremors, and you can see it clearly if you put a paper above the dorsum of the hand. So this is a fine tremors. Regarding the asterixis or flabbing tremors, ask the patient to do a dorsiflexion of the wrist and they make the fingers spread out so you will see the flabbing tremors. These flabbing tremors can occur in any organ failure, like in hepatic encephalopathy, uremic encephalopathy, and also in respiratory failure type 2 in case of accumulation of CO2, as in case of COBD. Here, this is the cyanosis in the fingers, as you see here, and this is the clubbing. You ask the patient to do like this to see this angle. If there is obstruction of this angle, it's called a Chambroof window. If this Chambroof window is closed, so this is a club. Regarding the clubbing in details, you ask the patient to put your hand like this, but it's important to see the finger tangentially. Uh, as you know, we have two angles here: angle between the nail bed. Uh, between the nail and the nail bit of the terminal phalanx, and also between the terminal phalanx and the middle phalanx. Usually, we ask, him, ask the patient to do like this on his fingers, and if this angle, normally this angle is spared, which is called a chambroof window. This is normally spared. If this chambroof window is closed like this, so this is a first degree, or this patient has a clubbing. Regarding the, the stages of clubbing, we have four stages in the uh, form of stage one, two, three, and four. Stage one, there is normal appearance of the angle, but there is increase in the fluctuancy of the nail bed. So you feel fluctuant here. Then stage two, there is a loss of this, the angle between the nail and the nail bed. Then stage three, there is increased curvature of the nail, as you see here. Then stage four, there is expansion of the terminal phalanx, like a drumstick appearance, and it's called hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthrosis. This is the, the fourth stage. What about causes of clubbing? As we know before, that there is uh, four important causes of clubbing: pulmonary in pulmonology cases, in cardiology cases, in GIT cases, and in endocrinology. And lastly, it may uh, be idiopathic. We will mention each cause of clubbing in each separate uh, lecture, in the concerned lecture. Regarding the causes of clubbing in the uh, pulmonology cases, we have 10 important causes. What? are the causes of clubbing in pulmonology station. Number one, bronchogenic carcinoma, which is the most common cause. Number two, mesothelioma. Number three, bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis, embyema, lung abscess, TB, asbestosis, and interstitial lung disease. Lastly, AV malformation, arteriovenous malformation. So, the malignancy, bronchogenic carcinoma and the mesothelioma, and the subjective lung disease like bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis, embyema, lung abscess, and the most important disease, TB, asbestosis, lung fibrosis, interstitial lung disease, and AB malformation. I'd like to remind you that the COBD is not mentioned here. So please kindly note that COBD itself 
is not a cause of clubbing. So if the patient has COPD, we will not expect that the, this patient has a club. But if the patient develops clubbing while he is known a case of COPD, so we have to think about another underlying disease associated with COPD. So what is the causes of clubbing in a case of COPD? We have four important causes. This patient with COPD may develop lung cancer or bronchitis changes or fibrosis or empyema. This is the four important causes that results in a patient with COPD develop a clock. Then coming to the pulse and respiratory rate. We are checking the pulse and respiratory rate simultaneously at the same time, assuming that we are checking the pulse and we are at the same time counting the respiratory rate without making the patient or without let the patient uh, give his attention to us because if the patient is aware that we are counting his respiratory rate, definitely the respiratory rate will be affected. Usually we are counting it in 15 seconds multiply by four. Then we mention that respiratory rate is about uh, how many cycles per minute uh, sorry, I'm speaking now about the, the, the pulse, how many uh, per minute, and uh, is it regular or regular. And regarding the respiratory rate, how many uh, rate per minute, average expected to be 12 to 20 uh, breath per minute. Here, as you see, that we are checking the pulse and the doctor counting the respiratory rate at the same time and holding the watch by the other hand. Remember that the, uh, an important uh, type of pulse is called pulses paradoxus. In case of obstructive lung disease, you will feel that the pulse volume is decreased with inspiration. It's called pulses paradoxus. The pulse volume is increased because uh, in, 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 in inspiration, you are making the thorax uh, negative intrathoracic pressure, and uh, this increased uh, the cardiac, uh, this increased the venous return to the right side of the heart while you are making chest expansion. So the negative intrathoracic pressure make the venous return to be more, and by Making venous return is more, the cardiac output is more, so the pulse volume will be more. But this will not happen in obstructive lung disease because the patient cannot make full expansion of the chest. So the negative intrathoracic pressure in case of obstructive lung disease is not obtained well. So that we will not expect that the pulse volume will be increased. So this is called pulses paradoxus. It means decrease in pulse volume when the patient taking inspiration, this coming in cases like obstructive lung disease, like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Then, comment about the pulse by the uh, seven items. We mentioned that in cardiology case before, uh, but let me remind you about the seven items. Uh, we will speak about the, the rate, how many beats per minute, the rhythm is it regular or irregular? Uh, usually, do not mention AF because AF is a diagnosed by ECG. You are not an ECG, you are just putting uh, your hands. So, say the rhythm is regular or it is irregular. And AF will be uh, expected to be found in patient with ACD or patient with mitral valve disease. Then, what about uh, equality on both sides? Is it equal or no? What about the volume? Low volume expected in patient with aortic stenosis due to low cardiac output, and high volume is expected with patient with aortic regurgitation due to hyperdynamic circulation. Then, special character, any special character like slow rising pulse in case of aortic stenosis, or collapsing pulse in case of aortic regurgitation, or any hyperdynamic circulation like uh, fever, uh, like pregnancy, thyrotoxicosis, etc. If there is any uh, radiofemoral delay and regarding the peripheral pulsation 
in dorsal species. This is the, the seven important items to comment about the buds. It is the same in uh, cardiology cases, but in respiratory cases, we are just saying that pulse uh, the number and regular, regular uh, in a rapid way. Then go to the GVB. We are putting the patient in 45 degrees and ask the patient to turn his head to the left side. Then you will see the GVB. GVB to be seen, not to be palpated. You will expect to mention is GVB is elevated or not elevated. Normally, it is normally four centimeter or no, so not elevated. Normally, it would be four centimeter. Or the GVB is elevated. You will mention how many centimeter water, and uh, you can comment about the V wave. If you have giant V wave, so it can indicate tricosmic regurgitation. And at this time, look for the signs of core pulmonary, pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary edema. Okay. And remember that the A wave is lost in case of atrial compression. In case of AF, you will not find an A wave. Also, if the patient has fixed engorged neck veins, is matching with superior vena cava obstruction, if the patient has congested non pulsating neck veins, so it's matching with COBD. As you mentioned before, we advise to uh, for carotid pulsation to auscultate the carotid arteries uh, for a brewy before palpate the carotid artery. Uh, carotid artery, carotid pulsation is checked by palpation, while the venous pulsation of GVB is seen, not palpated. Uh, for carotid, uh, usually uh, you auscultate firstly because uh, if you have a brewy, Theoretically, palpation may dislodge a leak, which can lead to a stroke. So in carotid pulsation, it's recommended to auscultate firstly, then palpate. Uh, a rapid review about the GVB. I mentioned that uh, in cardiology station before, but just to remind you, this is a, a sternocleidomastoid from the, from the uh, sternal uh, Manubrium sternae and from clavicle, so external cleido, then reach to the amastoid process. This is external cleido mastoid muscle. Behind it, you will find the uh, GVB. You will notice the oscillation of the muscle indicated the waves of the GVB. You can say this GVB, jugular venous pulse, or GVB, jugular venous pressure. And as you know, uh, the patient is lying in 45 degrees. You are checking the height of the uh, jugular venous pressure here and assuming that it's a horizontal rule and vertical rule. And this is the length of the elevation of the GVB above the manubrium sternum. Usually it is to be three centimeters and it indicates uh, that it is above the level of the uh, right atrium, the mid part of the right atrium. And as we mentioned before, that we can say millimeter mercury or uh, centimeter water. Uh, there is no uh, big uh, difference between the two terms. And the uh, GVD, uh, you have two descent, X descent and Y descent, and you have uh, three waves, A wave, C wave, and V wave. So you have three waves, A, C, V, and two descent X and Y. Again, here the uh, relation between S1 and S2, splitting of the S2 regarding uh, aortic and the pulmonary part. And this is the S1. You have the three waves, A wave, C wave, and V wave, and the two descent, X descent, and Y descent. Um, to make it easy for you, this is a theoretical uh, item. You will not be asked about that in the 
practical clinical uh, examination. Uh, but uh, you can know that A wave is coming from atrial contraction. C wave is coming from the C cusp of the tricuspid belt closure. And this cusp will bulge into the right atrium while the ventricle contract. Then the V wave is due to the venous return, venous return and atrial filling. And at this time, the tricuspid valve is closed. Regarding the descent waves, X wave is due to atrial relaxation. And at that time, the tricuspid valve is pulled down. The tricuspid valve is pulled down to accommodate more for the venous return. While the Y descent is uh, due to rapid emptying of the right atrium, and there is a RV filling from the RA. So the blood is coming from the right atrium to right uh, ventricle with rapid emptying of the right atrium. And at this time, the tricuspid valve is open. Just to tell you that the uh, A wave is, is just uh, before the uh, carotid bus, while the v, v wave is just after the carotid bus. So the one matched with carotid bus is the A wave, and the one next is the V wave. Um, regarding the uh, most important abnormalities in uh, GVB, uh, the uh, large A wave, it can uh, be due to tricuspid stenosis or pulmonary stenosis or pulmonary hypertension. The uh, very large A wave is called Canon A wave in complete heart block. The large V wave is very important because you can see it clinically in case of tricuspid regurgitation and pulmonary hypertension. The rabbit Y descent, as we mentioned, it's made due to tricuspid regurgitation or constrictive pericarditis. So uh, these waves, if you can imagine the cardiac cycle, it will be very easy to you. Regarding the difference between venous and carotid pulsations, we have to put it in our minds. What is the difference between venous pulsation and carotid pulsation? As we mentioned before, venous pulsation is not palpable, it is visible only. Okay, and in venous pulsation, you will see a double wave for the A wave and V wave. Venous pulsation is compressible because it is a vein and the wall of the vein is thin. So you can easily compress the vein by the muscle and by your finger. Also, by inspiration, there is a decrease in GVP. And also in supine position, the GVP is elevated and there is a hepatojugular reflux. Uh, as we mentioned before, that inspiration, you are taking a deep breath, so the intrathoracic pressure is negative, so this suction of blood and to facilitate the venous return from the uh, peripheral circulation to the right atrium, so the GVB will be decreased by inspiration. While in uh, supine position, uh, the GVB is expected to be uh, elevated because it is uh, due to gravity effect. Uh, and finally, the hepatojugular reflux, that means when you make a pressure in the right side of the upper quadrant at the liver, you might see there is an elevation of the GVB by this pressure. Comparing of this to the carotid pulsation, the carotid pulsation are palpable. Opposite to the venous pulsation, which is a visible. The carotid pulsation is a single wave. Venous pulsation was two wave. The venous was compressible, but the carotid is not easily compressible. Inspiration decreased GBB, but there is no effect of breathing on the carotid pulsation. Also, the changing of position will have no effect on carotid pulsation, and there is no hepatojugular reflex. These are the six items for comparing and comparison between venous pulsation and carotid pulsation. 
coming to the causes of elevated GVB. What are the causes of elevated GVB? Definitely, it will be right ventricular failure due to functional tricuspid regurgitation. Also, in case of tricuspid stenosis, so tricuspid stenosis and tricuspid regurgitation both can lead to elevated GVB. Pericardial compression in case of constrictive pericarditis or pericardial tamponade. Also, in case of restrictive cardiomyopathy, so there is an impairment of the venous return, so there is elevated GVB. Also, in case of subiru vena cava obstruction, in case of circulatory overload, especially in patient with renal failure. What about causes of low GVB? In any case of dehydration or hypovolemia. Remember that cosmal sign. Cosmal sign, it means paradoxical rise in GVB during inspiration. So, as we mentioned before, that during inspiration, you are opening the chest and there is negative intrathoracic pressure. So, expect that the GVB is coming more and there is drop of the venous return to the right atrium. But in case of restrictive cardiomyopathy, you will expect that there is no good filling of the right atrium by this venous return. So it's called paradoxical rise in the GVB during inspiration in case of restrictive cardiomyopathy. It's called cosmal signs. Then coming to the face, we are uh, going from peripheral to the center. Now we are going to the we're checking the hand, then the neck, GVB, carotid pulsation. Then we are going to the face. What we will see in the face? We're checking the eyes. Ask the patient to look up and look down. Check for the colors, especially the pallor and jaundice. You will expect uh, jaundice in case of hepatic congestion, in case of right-sided heart failure. And also in case of a malignancy with liver metastasis. Horner syndrome, as we know, consists, consists of uh, four items, ptosis, meiosis, anhydrosis, and enophallus. Then go to mouse. Check the mouse for central cyanosis in mouse and lips. Ask the patient to avert the tongue up. Look for any first lip breathing, especially in case of uh, obstructive lung disease like COBD. Uh, others like uh, Cushing Goit faces, in case of patient using long term steroid, you'll find a moon face, which is called Cushing Goit faces, buffalo hump, uh, buccal uh, fat in intrascapular area or supercapital area. Uh, you might see a polythysemia, plethora, in case of secondary through hypoxia in case of COVD, uh, also lupus perneum, uh, redness in the tip of the nose. This is characteristic of sarcoidosis. Here you will check a pallor by pulling the lid down, and here for the jaundice. Okay. Then coming to the chest itself, uh, just to remind you that this is the mid line mid sternal line this mid clavicular line right side is left mid clavicular line this is the axilla in the middle there is a mid axillary line and in front this is anterior axillary line and this is the posterior axillary line this is all this is called axillary area you have to check it by inspection palpation percussion scultation at the level of three levels up middle and down inspection palpation percussion, auscultation. Very important, the axilla. Don't miss the axilla in the chest examination. Then coming to our uh, four important items in chest examination. Inspection, palpation, percussion, auscultation. In inspection from the front, uh, you will find either there is a scar, Search for scars is very important and it will give you uh, important clues for the chest cases. Like mid axillary scar in case of chest intercostal tube drains, 
thracotomy scars, okay, it's of lobectomy or pneumonectomy, mediastinoscopy scar, this is usually at the uh, suprasternal notch, I will let you see a photo later, and lung biopsy scars, the right side or left side of the thorax, maybe lymph node biopsy scars, so the scars is very important in the chest cases. Also, check for any skin changes like radiation perms, in case of tumors. Also, checking for chest wall deformity, any specific features or of the chest, like barrel shaped chest, in case of COBD, obstructive, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, barrel shaped chest, the uh, the, the, the diameter, the transverse diameter, is equal to the posterior anterior diameter of the chest, which again is to the normal. Also, you uh, may see pectus excavatum or pectus carinatum. Pectus excavatum from the name, cavatum, cavity. So it's like a depression in the sternum. Pectus excavatum, funnel, like a depression, like a shoemaker. It's called before shoemaker chest due to repeated uh, tapping on the sternum. So it's called pectus excavatum. And pectus carinatum is like a vision, like a bird. It's out to the bulge of the sternum. Also, kyphoscoliosis is very important because it can be seen in patient with ankylosing spondylitis. And ankylosing spondylitis, uh, they have a characteristic apical lung fibrosis. Asymmetry, like in case of lung fibrosis, pneumonectomy, Thracoplasty, it's an old method of TB treatment before with re removal. Here is a picture of pectus excavatum cavity, as I mentioned here, pectus excavatum, a depression, funnel, or show uh, maker chest before. And this is called pectus carinatum vision, like a bird chest, it's outward bulge. Please don't forget inspection of the axilla. It will give you a lot. You will miss a scar. You will find a chest tube drain scar. You can uh, get a big clue, a big finding from axilla inspection and palpation, percussion, scortation, as we mentioned later. Uh, most important scars in the chest, uh, as you see here in the picture, this is a a uh, midline sternotomy scar, usually in cardiac uh, surgery or cabbage, coronal blast graft or valve replacement. Uh, also, this is a scar, it's called anterior thoracotomy scar. So you have a scar here in the anterior side, not reaching to the lateral or the posterior. Area. So it's called anterior thoracotomy scar. Maybe lung biopsy, maybe excisional, maybe something like this. Then uh, this is scar which coming from the back mainly and the axilla, but you cannot find in the front. So it's very important to check axilla and the back for this scar. It's called posterolateral scar. Postro and lateral from posterior and lateral area. It's posterolateral scar. It can be due to pneumonectomy or lobectomy. Okay. Then this scar, which is subcostal uh, bilateral. Uh, scar, it's characteristic for double lung transplantation and it's called clam shell scar. So it's called clam shell scar due to double lung transplantation. And uh, this scar definitely, you know, it, it in the left uh, subclavicular area, usually due to a pacemaker insertion. Here also some uh, photos like. Uh, this is a mediastinoscopy scar, as I mentioned here before. This is above the suprasternal notch, this mediastinoscopy scar. It is not like the tracheostomy. Tracheostomy is here at the level of the trochea, but this is at the level of the suprasternal notch. So it's mediastinoscopy scar. And if you find the scar here, it's called a tracheostomy scar, which will indicate that this patient had a, a long term uh, prolonged intubation, more than two weeks and he deserved to be uh, tracheostomized. There's tracheostomy scar here, and after that, disconnected, and we closed this scar, but this scar will be uh, obvious if you uh, concentrate in this area. So this is uh, the scar of tracheostomy scar. This is the scar of mediastinoscopy scar. Also, this is a clamshell scar. Clamshell scar, as I told you before, bilaterally subcostal scar due to double lung transplantation, and this is the 
post-lateral thoracotomy scar in case of lobectomy or pneumonectomy. Also, you can find here a chest drain scar or any vast scar or any tube scar like this. So this is a garment inspection. What about palpation? In palpation, you're checking the uh, front of the patient. You are checking the apex. Then, to know the site of the apex. Uh, usually, it is left fifth intercostal space at mid clavicular line. And as I mentioned to you, if the, you did not find the apex at the left side, checking at the right side, it may be this is a case of dextrocardia and a case of cartagenar syndrome with bronchitis here. Then after apex lift, parasternal heap, uh, lift parasternal thrill, it is indicated that there is right ventricular pressure overload in case of pulmonary hypertension. Then checking the pulmonary area, if you can palpate, palpable pulmonary component of second heart sound, it indicates a pulmonary hypertension. Then coming to the chest expansion, which is very important. Chest expansion, we are checking in uh, three zones, supramammary, and memory and inframemory by both your hands you are wrapping your hand and your finger around the chest of the patient super memory then at the memory level then inframemory and ask the patient to take a deep breath and observe the thumb your thumb you are usually making your thumb approximate to each other and taking a skin fold and to see if the expansion is equal and normal to each side, so this is normal chest expansion. Or you have a limited chest expansion all over the chest in the right and the left side is right and left hemothorax, but it is limited chest expansion and equal in both sides, equal but limited. Yeah, this is in case of COBD because you have a limited chest expansion due to emphysema plus lung. Or you have a unilateral or localized retraction or localized unilateral reduction of chest expansion like in case of lung fibrosis or uh, there is a unilateral disease like a uh, patient has a uh, lobectomy or pneumonectomy. In case of pneumonectomy, you will have a, or lobectomy, you will have a unilateral reduced chest expansion in one side of the chest. Okay. We'll let you see here uh, the photo of uh, here. This is counting the apex by putting right hand in the apex, and it is, the apex is defined as the outermost and lowermost uh, pulsation. Try to count. Yes, this is the apex, left fifth intercostal space, metacarbical line. If you did not find apex here, we check apex in the right side, maybe dextrocardia in case of Cartagena syndrome associated with bronchiectasis. Yeah. And here you are after checking the apex, checking the left parasternal area by heel of the fingers, then go to the pulmonary area, then after that, checking the chest expansion. Chest expansion, go to the uh, three, three zones. Firstly, supramammary area, then at the level of the memory, then below the memory and from memory area. You are checking the, uh, your thumb here and here, and taking a skin fold and check how the expansion is uh, going. Is it equally or unilaterally or one side more than the other? Normally it is about four centimeter and there is uh, uh, expansion and there is a space between you to a thumb while the patient taking a deep breath. Clinically, if you do it in a patient, you'll find it very easy. Regarding percussion, front of the patient, I'd like to emphasize that the percussion of the chest is a heavy percussion. While in percussion of the abdomen is a light percussion. Chest is a heavy percussion. It's very important to know the technique. You are percussion with the middle finger of the dominant hand over the middle phalanx of the middle finger of the non-dominant hand, which is booted on the patient chest. Start the from the supraclavicular area, then percussion of the clavicle itself, then downward after the clavicle. Uh, usually, supraclavicular area, very important to not miss any apical lesions, and to go to the clavicle either by direct percussion, put your finger on the clavicle directly, 
or indirectly like any percussion from like you do the tip of the middle finger of dominant hand over the middle phalanx of the middle finger of the non-dominant hand direct or indirect some books this and this whatever you you do both are the same then go and move downward percussion along the uh, chest uh, zones uh, two uh, spaces above the memory and uh, two or three spaces below the memory area and don't forget to percuss to, to percuss the uh, axillary area the upper and lower part and also checking the upper border uh, of, the, of the liver if the upper border of the liver is closed down this indicates that the patient has emphysema as i mentioned to you before don't forget a percussion of the axillary area uh, regarding uh, tactile vocal frame it is, it is not now uh, not routinely used now and now replaced by the vocal resonance tactile vocal frame it is that you are putting uh, your, the radial part of your hands in the intercostal space of the patient and ask the patient to say 99 and go down 99 99 and see the tactile vocal frame it is. but it's now replaced by the vocal resonance as we mentioned it. Then, what you will find in a percussion? What's the type of percussion notes that you expect to find? You have four uh, modalities of percussion notes, either normal resonant, the patient is normal resonant, or it is hyper resonant, and this hyper resonant may be bilateral, as in case of COBD due to emphysema, or this is hyper resonant unilaterally, as in case of pneumococcus. Or this an impaired dullness, a bird note of dullness, and it means that a patient has consolidation, collapse, fibrosis, bronchitis, or lobectomy. So we expect to have a dullness, or a stony dullness, which is a very specific to pleural fusion. So normal resonant, hyper resonant, impaired note dullness, and stony dullness. What about auscultation? Auscultation in front of the chest, usually you ask the patient to take a deep breath in and breath out through the patient mouth, not from the nose, and start from the supraclavicular area, putting your stethoscope by using the pill, and then go downward using the diaphragm. But it's preferable to check the supraclavicular area by pill due to the size of supraclavicular area. And you can go after that in a zigzag manner from bottom, from the top to down like this zigzag manner. Okay. In auscultation, uh, you have to check the four important items as we mentioned before. Number one, the air entry. Is it equal bilateral or not? Or if you have a diminished air entry in one side or you have absent air entry. Okay. Then go to the type of breathing. What is, what is the types of breathing? You have vehicular pressing and bronchial pressing. So, either you will hear a normal vesicular pressing, normal vesicular pressing, okay, or vesicular pressing with prolonged expiration, as in case of obstructive lung disease, asthma, or COBD. And in the vesicular pressing, you will find that the expiration is prolonged than inspiration, which is against the norm. The norm is Inspiration is slightly longer than expiration. Or bronchial breathing. Bronchial breathing is characterized in S3 C's. Consolidation, cavity, and collapse. So bronchial breathing, it means consolidation, cavity, and collapse. Uh, when you hear a bronchial breathing, try to confirm this by uh, vocal resonance by Ask the patient to say 99 loudly and then ask the patient to say 99 slowly or whispering. You will find that you can hear it very loudly in case of collapse, cavity, or consolidation. Additional sounds such as ronchi or crepitations or rub, plural rub. The uh, expiratory ronchi, if you have expiratory ronchi, as in case of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Or you will find a, a crepitations, which is either uh, to be 
uh, fine bilaterally, basally, end in inspiratory crepitation, at the end of inspiration, and it is not cleared with cough. This is characteristic for two diseases, the lung fibrosis and the pulmonary edema, by fine end in inspiratory crepitation. At the end of inspiration, you'll find fine crepitation. This is for fibrosis and pulmonary edema. But if it's a coarse crepitation and it's coming at the early inspiration and is it changed with cough, this is matching with bronchitis. Pleural lump definitely due to pleurisy as in case of secondary to pneumonia or pulmonary embolism. Lastly, the vocal resonance, as I mentioned to you, that it is asking the patient to say 99 and re oscultate the chest again while the patient is saying 99. 99, 99, 99. You ask the patient to say 99 loudly. Then another term, re oscultate in the same oscultatory area, asking the patient to say 99, whispering. So one time loudly, one time whispering. You can uh, do not waste your time, uh, make it specifically if you hear a bronchial breathing, ask the patient to say 99, whispering. It will help you a lot. Regarding the uh, lens of inspiratory and expiration, uh, which you see this uh, diaphragm. Usually, this is inspiration and this is expiration. Inspiration is longer than expiration. This is normally. Inspiration is longer than expiration. This is a vesicular bracing. The vesicular bracing with prolonged expiration, you'll find that expiration is prolonged than the inspiration. This is matching with COBD. What about this? This is a bronchial bracing. You will find inspiration is equal to expiration. Both are equal, and there is a pause between inspiration and expiration. A hollow bracing here. This is called bronchial breathing. Okay. So as we mentioned, the auscultation, you're checking the air entry, types of breathing, additional sounds, and last lastly the vocal rhythm. This is the most important four items in auscultation. Regarding the vocal resonance, I want to speak about it, that vocal resonance causes of increased vocal resonance. Uh, the vocal resonance is increased in all lung diseases, especially consolidation, collapse, cavity, the three C's, which is coming also in the bronchial uh, breathing, plus bronchitis and in case of dense fibrosis. This is the causes of increased vocal resonance. What about the causes of decreased vocal resonance? Decreased vocal resonance as any cause of decreased breathing, like there is water, pleural effusion, there is air, pneumothorax, there is no lung lobectomy or pneumonectomy, one loop removed or the whole lung is removed. So pleural effusion, pneumothorax, lobectomy, pneumonectomy, and an early fibrosis. Okay, as I mentioned to you before, if you find there is increased vocal resonance in a specific area, ask the patient to say 99 by whispering. If it's still high voice in that specific area, so you expect to, to have uh, either consolidation or cavity or collapse. Remember that in auscultation, Please don't do like this. Don't escalate over the gown, over the clothes, over the bra, inside like this. I'm not seeing the skin. This is, is not accepted in the exam. And the examiner comment about that. After checking the patient from the front, we ask the patient to sit up. This is a transitional zone. Transitional zone. We will ask the patient to sit up from the 45 degree, the patient is set up 90 degree, and after sitting up, you examine the patient from the back. While the patient is set up, there is four important things you have to do. Number one, tracheal position. Is the trachea central or deviated? And you will see the uh, tracheal position, tracheal tug, crico sternal notch, and proximal mitosis. Regarding tracheal position, it is central or deviated. Usually the trachea is centrally or slightly deviated to the right side. You may have a trachea deviated. Either this deviation is pulling the trachea to one side or it is pushed from the other side. So what are the causes that make the trachea deviated, pulled to the other side? 
present case of lung fibrosis. So it, it, it pulls the trachea, okay? And, and case of lobectomy, especially upper lobe lobectomy. Case of pneumonectomy. Case of apical lung collapse or lung collapse. So these four causes lead to deviation of the trachea to the affected side. What about the deviation of the trochea is due to displaced or pushed, okay, from the other side. Like in case of large pleural effusion or large pneumothorax, or there's a lung mass cancer. This is the three causes of pushing of trochea to the other side, okay. So this is number one regarding the trochea bulge. Number two, cricosternal notch. We are checking this cricosternal notch from the cricoid bone to the sternal notch. Normally, it accommodates three finger breaths. Three finger breaths is the patient's own fingers, okay? If it is less than three fingers, you expect that this patient has a lung hyperinflation and emphysematous lung in case of COBD. Then uh, the uh, trogel tug in case of uh, COBD, you uh, will see that there is a vertical just expansion and will uh, feel the trochea tug while the patient take a deep inspiration. Lastly, proximal myopathy with the patient is long use of a steroid, especially in lung fibrosis. You will find a feature of a cushion gold face, is bruising, thin skin, proximal myopathy, etc. Kindly note that uh, here in the trochaeal shift, uh, we are checking the trochaeal position by the uh, putting the finger inside here and checking the distance between the trochea and the sternal, uh, sternal end of the clavicle or the sternal end of the other clavicle or other methods that you feel by the middle finger, your middle finger inside the curve of the trochea and putting the index and the uh, ring finger between the two muscles, okay? And uh, in case of uh, trochea uh, is central, while there is a large pleural effusion, because as we mentioned before, large pleural effusion, usually there is a shifting of uh, trochea to the other side. But if you have large pleural effusion and the trochea is still central, so this suggests that there is underlying lung collapse by this large pleural effusion. Then, after this stage, while making the patient sit up, you ask the patient, we will check in the back of the patient. So in the posterior aspect of the patient, while the patient is sitting up, we will check the same. Chest back expansion, chest back percussion, chest back auscultation, and the sacral uh, edema after that, and uh, the plus or minus the uh, lymph nodes if it is necessary. Here, Checking the back expansion, as mentioned before in the front, expansion of the back uh, in the uh, three area also. Uh, and also checking the back percussion as before. And lead the patient to approximate his uh, upper limbs to make the spaces uh, away. And chest back auscultation, the same in the sculptatory area. Uh, in uh, three zones, and if you have a crepitation while you scuff the patient, ask the patient to cough is very, very important. If the secretions or crepitation is changed, so this is a secretion, or if it's an altered only but still present, so it means okay. If it is not changed, we scuff and this crepitation coming in the end in a spiratory phase, so it's pulmonary edema or pulmonary fibrosis, as we mentioned before. Then it's checking the sacral edema. Ask the patient uh, if you have any pain in this area or no, and look at the eye of the patient and press here gently. If you have sacral edema, it indicates the patient has core pulmonary. And lastly, the lymph node, if indicated or suspected, as in case of TB, sarcoidosis, cancer, or checking the lymph node in the neck or supraclavicular area or axillary area. If you have a time, or if it is indicated. After posterior aspects, uh, we want to emphasize that in posterior aspect, you check expansion and percussion and auscultation. And this is the uh, photo to demonstrate 
for you. The chest expansion, upper zone, middle zone, lower zone. So at uh, above the scapula and at the level of the scapula and the below the scapula. And here the percussion in the interscapular area above here and mid scapular area here and down here and here in a zigzag manner. And lastly, the escalation in the same uh, three zones above and mid scapular and lower scapular. And pay an attention while you escalate the base of the lung and the axilla here for the crevitations, as we mentioned before. Is it change of scuff or altered only? Or this uh, crevitation is in the inspiratory crevitations matching with fibrosis or uh, pulmonary edema, or it is uh, coarse crevitations and it is not alt uh, not a change in the scuff or altered the scuff is matched with bronchitis. Lastly, we'll check the lower limb regarding any lower limb edema to indicate there is core pulmonary pitting or no, what is the level, and it checks the calf muscle, is it lax or no, indicates the signs of DVT, and the erythema nodosum to indicate there is sarcoidosis. Here, we are pressing the uh, below the medial malleus and down, below and down. This is the first area of uh, beaten edema. Then, we we'll check also the calf muscle, is it lax, any swelling, any change of the size, any picture suggestive of DVT or no. After lower limb, we are coming to the end of the examination. You have to thank the patient with hand shaking and smile, cover the patient and help him to rest, and wash your hands, look to the examiners, and present your findings. And uh, as I mentioned to you before, don't forget the three important negative findings. Pulmonary hypertension, core pulmonary respiratory failure. The patient do not has features of pulmonary hypertension, does not have features of core pulmonary the patient does not have features of respiratory failure. And lastly, it's optional to say that I'd like to check oxygen saturation, uh, patient chart, peak flow meter, peak expiratory flow meter, uh, sputum examination from sputum pot, history taking, if he's a smoker or no, or COBD. Regarding the uh, common examiner's questions, what's your positive finding? Then what's your diagnosis? What's your differential diagnosis? And lastly, we ask you about investigations and treatment, and this is a scale of clinical judgment. Uh, I'd like to tell you some important slides. We aren't finished now, I'd like to tell you some important slides. What, is, what are the signs of pulmonary hypertension? Uh, we mentioned that before in cardiology uh, literature, but I'd like to remind you again here. Elevation of the GVB with giant V waves, left parasternal heave, left parasternal frill, and palpable pulmonary component of the second heart sound, palpable P2 over the pulmonary area, and by auscultation, loud pulmonary component of second heart sound, loud P2 over pulmonary area, and Graham steel murmur, which is a functional pulmonary regurgitation and there is a functional tricuspid regurgitation, and lastly, the bilateral basal crepitations and lower limb edema. So these are the nine signs of pulmonary hypertension. Then what are the signs of core pulmonary? Core pulmonary, it means right side heart failure due to a respiratory disorder. Signs of core pulmonary are elevation of the GVB, congestive tender hematomegaly, ascites, sacral edema, scrotal edema, lastly the lower limb edema. All these six features are the feature of right ventricular failure. Okay. I'd like to recommend for you uh, this uh, Greek medics uh, tube, very interesting and very uh, clear for steps of examination. Then you will face the most important question with the examiner. What is the investigations in respiratory cases? What will you do for this case? Generally speaking, 
general investigations needed in respiratory case, you can see like the basic investigations, the form of complete blood count, ESR, CRP, urea and electrolyte, and liver function test. Then sputum cultural sensitivity, plus or minus sputum acid fast lie in three morning samples. Chest X-ray, high resolution CT chest, ABG, detecting respiratory failure type 1 or type 2, hypoxia only or hypoxia and hyper cabinet, pulmonary function tests, bronchoscopy and bronchoalveolar lavage, ECG, and echocardiography. This is rapidly in summary. By details, I will mention to you now the details of these investigations. Firstly, the basic investigations, as we mentioned before, CBC, ESR, CRB, urea electrolyte liver function tests, sputum culture sensitivity, sputum acid fast lie. Chest X-ray, what you will find in chest X-ray, for the three important uh, diagnoses, the uh, pulmonary fibrosis, you will find reticular nodular shadow. In COBD, you will find hyperinflated lung, you will find flat diaphragm, flat cubital of the diaphragm, horizontal rib, and ribbon-shaped heart. Okay, in bronchitis, you'll find honeycomb appearance, tram lines, ring shadows. What about high resolution CT chest? In flank fibrosis, you'll find ground glass appearance. In COBD, you'll find the complications of COBD like bronchitis changes, lung cancer, mass, etc. In bronchitis, you'll find signet ring appearance. Signet ring appearance like two rings, one of the bronchioles and one of the blood vessels. And if they dilate, dilated uh, permanent dilatation of the bronchioles, so it will be wider uh, ring. What about ABG? To check uh, the type 1 and type 2 respiratory failure, as we know, type 1 is hypoxic respiratory failure. Type 2 is hypoxia and hypercapnia, like in case of COPD. So we are checking the uh, PCO2 and bicarbonate is elevated in chronic CO2 retention, and checking the pH is compensated or not compensated to detect the severity. Then, pulmonary function test. We have restrictive pattern and obstructive pattern. It's very important to know. In case of a restrictive pattern, like uh, pulmonary fibrosis, we expect that expiratory, the forced expiratory volume one over forced wider capacity is more than 70%. But in obstructive pattern, like in COBD, you'll find that forced expiratory volume 1 over forced vital capacity is less than 70%. In bronchiectasis, you can find either restrictive pattern or obstructive pattern or normal pulmonary function test. Here I would like to tell you that by forced expiratory volume 1, in case of COBD, it is further classified according to, to the gold category into uh, uh, four classifications regarding the forced expiratory volume one. I will mention that to you later. Then bronchoscopy and bronchoalveolar lavage to exclude any infection before giving immunosuppressive medication. Also to rule out malignancy by checking malignant cells. And also, if the lymphocytes predominant than the neutrophils, it is a better prognosis, and it means as a case of as a case of pulmonary fibrosis with more predominant lymphocytes, it will be a steroid responsive. Okay, and the ECG definitely to check the resin, any manifestation of right ventricular hypertrophy, plus or minus strain pattern, any P pulmonal, any right atrial uh, right axis deviation any right bundle planch block, echocardiography to check any tricuspid regurgitation, pulmonary hypertension, or core pulmonary. Here in pulmonary function test, it's very important to know the force expiratory volume 1 over force vital capacity. If more than 70, this is a restrictive button. If it is less than 70, this is an obstructive button. Then, in case of COBD, the force expiratory volume 1 alone can categorize the COBD by gold stages. Gold is abbreviation of uh, a global initiative, global initiative assessment of obstructive lung disease into mild, moderate, severe, very severe. Mild, more than 80, moderate from 80 to 30, severe, 
from uh, sorry uh, mild more than 80 percent of expected moderate from 80 to 50 percent of expected then severe is from 50 to 30 percent of expected and very severe is it less than 30 percent of the expected so this will be the gold stages of COBD by the forced expiratory volume one. This is the details of investigations in respiratory cases. After investigations, we'll come to the treatment. What will be the treatment in respiratory cases? Firstly, as we know, non-pharmacological and pharmacological and surgical or intervention treatment. Non-pharmacological treatment will be patient education, patient counseling, stop smoking and refer him to the smoking cessation clinic, vaccination, especially the pneumococcal vaccine, MOFAS influenza vaccine, and the viral seasonal annual flu vaccine. Then pulmonary rehabilitation program, including chest physiotherapy and the nutritional support. After that, the pharmacological treatment in the form of APC, A antibiotic indicated, and according to the culture sensitivity of sputum and according to the most common organism affecting the disease. Number two, bronchodilators like uh, short acting beta agonist or long acting beta agonist or inhaled corticosteroid, sometimes this come in one inhaler, long acting beta agonist and the inhaled corticosteroid, and LAMA, long acting masculinic antagonist. C is corticosteroids, also if indicated. Then, especially in case of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, the new antifibrotic agents like perfinidone and nintadinib. This perfinidone and nintadinib is a new medication used for an idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. In case of COBD, there is a long-term oxygen therapy and by PEP. Okay. And definitely the treatment of the cause, if the patient has a TB or the patient has pulmonary fibrosis secondary to an underlying disease, after treatment of the cause and treatment of the complication, especially the pulmonary hypertension and core pulmonary. Regarding this surgical treatment, it will be uh, according to the disease like interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, we are doing single lung transplantation. In case of COBD, we are doing removing of the poly, if there is polypolectomy, we are doing endobronchial valve replacement, lung volume reduction surgery to decrease the emphysema of lung volume or single lung transplantation. In case of bronchiectins, we are doing lobectomy, pneumonectomy, or sometimes bronchiectins complicated by hemopsis, so we are doing bronchial artery embolization and also lung transplantation. Just I'd like to tell you an important topic like uh, long-term oxygen therapy. What are the inclusion criteria for using long-term oxygen therapy? Definitely the patient has to stop smoking and to confirm that he is stopping smoking by checking the carboxyhemoglobin to be less than 3%. Then checking the ABG of the patient, checking the PO2 uh, should be less than 7.3 kilopascal and the patient is stable or the BO2 is between 7.3 and 8, and the patient is stable with one of the following four. Either the patient has polycythemia, or nocturnal hypoxia, or pulmonary hypertension, or core pulmonary. One of these is sufficient as an indication for a long-term oxygen therapy. So it's called by Arabic, Ahmar, Azra, Lakht, Marra. Uh, kindly note that uh, the case of checking the ABG should be measured while the patient is clinically stable and in two separate uh, occasions and at least three weeks apart. Okay, and uh, definitely note that the long term oxygen therapy is given at hospital or even at the home by giving the patient nasal cannula, low flow oxygen from two to three, no more than this, two to three liters per minute via nasal cannula, at least 15 hours a day, and our target of oxygen saturation is 88 to 92 percent only. We are not giving high flow oxygen to not uh, stop or to not suppress the patient on hypoxic drug.
okay is very very important then coming to the uh, famous question regarding the differential diagnosis or what is the difference between asthma and COPD surely you have four important uh, differences we we'll mention here in this inquest uh, diurnal variation the asthma is increased mostly at night number two the reversible reversible reversibility the asthma is reversible so in reversibility the asthma is reversible then what's called fractional excretion of inhaled nitric oxide you are checking the nitric oxide in exhaled here it is increased in asthma okay and lastly the pulmonary function test during attack or in between the attack during the attack both COPD and asthma will give an obstructive pattern as we mentioned before forced expiratory volume one over forced vital capacity will be less than 70 percent okay but we are checking the TLCO it's called the carbon monoxide transfer factor in asthma it's increased in COPD it is decreased or normal and kindly note that this TLCO is correlate with the severity of the asthma okay and in between the attacks you will find that the asthma the pulmonary function test will be normal because asthma is coming in attacks but the COPD still the patient will have an obstructive pattern of pulmonary function test lastly i'd like to uh, thank you so much for your attendance and for your uh, sharing with me this lecture i hope you get benefit from uh, this all uh, the best for you and all best uh, luck and achievement and success for you in the exam uh, if you have any queries or any concerns please don't hesitate to contact me by uh, through all these uh, channels uh, please uh, see and like and subscribe and share uh, with others and uh, let the benefit for all of us thank you again and uh, good luck and assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh